Welcome to People in Profit. I'm Yuka Royer. 2023 saw inflation slow down and a much feared recession averted in major economies. But as we begin a new year, the world is facing potential crises once again, including here in Europe, with two military conflicts on its doorstep. Now, to discuss more, we can speak with Ian Bremer, president and founder of the Eurasia Group, that has just released its annual ranking of the biggest risks facing our world. This year, the US at war with itself is topping the list, followed by a Middle East on the brink and a partitioned Ukraine but ungoverned artificial intelligence, a weaker Chinese economy and the fight for critical minerals are also among the biggest threats identified in the report. Ian, thank you for being with us. Sure, my pleasure. Good to be back. Well, you're calling 2024 the Annus Horribilis, the Voldemort of years. That's a rather grim take on the year ahead. It is uh, three major geopolitical conflicts with the antagonists not even sharing basic sense of facts, no prospect for diplomacy uh, bringing any of these to a close. Uh, I don't, we've never experienced anything like that in the uh, in the modern age, and that is uh, the backdrop for this uh, particularly disturbing uh, and conflict-laden topper's report. Well, now, US politics, as I mentioned earlier, is at the top of your list, but let's uh, talk first about risk number two, the Middle East. The Israeli-Hamas conflict is escalating with no end in sight, and there are increasing fears that it could morph into a wider regional conflict. With Houthi rebels in Yemen attacking tankers and commercial ships in the Red Sea, it has already taken a toll on global trade. How much worse can it get? Well, the Americans have been trying, both by themselves and with a small alliance, to deter the Houthis from further attacks. That deterrence has failed. And so it looks increasingly likely that the Americans will engage in direct strikes against the Houthis in their bases in Yemen. And of course, that is a significant escalation of the conflict. So too, the potential that Iranian proxies, Shia radicals in Iraq and Syria uh, will exact uh, greater casualties on Americans in the region, um, and that would lead to an escalation. America's ability to contain Israel from not attacking and not increasing uh, their skirmishes with Hezbollah across the northern border in Lebanon, that's a real challenge. And then finally, we have the very real radicalization of millions and millions of Muslims, both in the Middle East and around the world, some of whom will turn to violence. So as you see, it's not just about the Houthis in Yemen. There are so many ways that this conflict is likely to escalate, and you'd have to be very smart and very lucky to keep the war largely contained in Gaza. So in that respect, how far can this crisis test global cooperation? Well, the worst scenario would be the Americans fighting directly with Iran. I don't think it's likely, but it's possible. Neither country wants that war, but as Trotsky says, sometimes you don't want war, sometimes war wants you. If that were to occur, we'd have 150 $200 oil, a global recession. Trump would certainly win the 2024 election. Lots of other things would come as a consequence. But even with the war as it stands, the United States today is more isolated in its support for Israel than Russia was when it invaded Ukraine two years ago. You see that in the General Assembly votes. You see that with the demonstrations and the politics around it. Biden also has significant problems at home because a majority of his own Democratic supporters are more closely aligned and sympathetic with the Palestinian cause than they are with the Israelis. This only three months after the Jews faced the worst violence in the world since the Holocaust. So the stakes, as you see, are quite high. Now, and also, of course, there's another war we are seeing in Ukraine, number three on your list. Uh, after last year's fa failed counteroffensive, uh, you're saying that a partitioned Ukraine is now inevitable. Does that mean a victory for Russia? Uh, no, it doesn't mean a victory for Russia because, of course, NATO has expanded. Uh, and if that was the reason why Russia invaded Ukraine, they've got bigger national security problems. They're still seen as a pariah by the G7 and other advanced industrial de uh, democracies. Their, half of their total foreign assets have been frozen. Uh, 12 rounds of sanctions from the Europeans, the United States, step by step. No, none of that makes the Russians look like winners. 
But the Ukrainians increasingly look like losers. I mean, 20 percent of their territory is going to end up minimum um, in Russian hands. And, and it, it pains me to say that. I don't want that outcome. But that's where we are. And I think that if we look in the rearview mirror from 2023, that was peak transatlantic cooperation. That was peak NATO. And now we're seeing political divisions. We're seeing Americans not wanting to pay that money on the back of the taxpayers. We're seeing the Germans uh, increasingly having a hard time finding more budget to support Ukraine. We're seeing Viktor Orban in Hungary increasingly intransigent in undermining the European ability and willingness to provide support for Ukraine. And all of this is going to make Ukrainian President Zelensky um, much more desperate as he tries to hold on to his country. And desperation is clearly uh, a dangerous thing. Now, uh, Russia militarily, to some extent, has been bolstered by its allies that, uh, you've, that form the axis of rogues, as you call them. Uh, North Korea has been providing Moscow with, uh, with ammunition and Iran with drones. How dangerous are these countries? Well, first of all, you'll note that China's not on that list. They're not providing military support for Russia. And the Chinese do uh, want a level of global stability so that they can continue to flourish economically, politically, and from a national security perspective. That is not true of Russia, Iran, and North Korea. These are chaos agents uh, who are uh, effectively pariahs for the entire advanced industrial democratic community, whether it's France or Germany or the United States or Canada or Japan or South Korea. And, and therefore, their cooperation is much more dangerous on the global stage. It's not just that the North Koreans and the Iranians are providing the military capacity for Russia to continue and further that war, though that's a big deal. It's also that the Russians are providing advanced technologies to these countries and also giving them diplomatic cover to engage in behavior that is destabilizing in their own backyards. Definitely countries like North Korea and Iran are emboldened by their support by the most powerful rogue state in history, Putin's Russia. Now, uh, as you mentioned earlier, the U.S. obviously has a huge role to play in keeping the world safe. Uh, but it has to deal with these crises at a time when its own society is becoming increasingly polarised. With the November elections approaching, uh, you've listed American politics, in fact, as the biggest threat to the world this year. That's right. American democracy uh, is in crisis. Uh, despite the fact that the economy is robust and the U.S. has the only global uh, defense capabilities that can project its power around the world, the U.S. today is the only advanced democracy that is incapable of having a free and fair election transferring power that is seen as legitimate by its population. That's not a problem in France or the U.K. or Japan. It is in the United States. And this is going to start in the next couple months when Trump very likely gets the nomination. And at that point, he is going to be vastly more powerful. He will have the very strong support of the entire Republican Party and the right-wing media and have the money uh, to push his policies. And those policies, whether they're on the border with Mexico or they're on no more support for Zelensky or they're on a much more uh, hawkish uh, approach to Iran, those will become the policies of the Republican Party. They'll have much more implication globally. As we look ahead to the election itself, there is so much more to play for. It is so much more existential. If Trump loses, he goes to jail. So he will do everything he can, everything in his power to get his supporters to legally and illegally prevent that from happening. If Trump wins, Biden and his supporters, many of his advisors believe that when Trump politicizes the Department of Justice, the Federal Bureau of Investigations, the Internal Revenue Service, that they will face legal jeopardy themselves, a new McCarthyism that will chill opposition in the U.S. and make the U.S. no longer a consolidated democracy, but instead a hybrid system that feels closer to a one-party outcome. That is unprecedented um, in the United States. Certainly, we've seen nothing like it post-Civil War, and it's very, very disturbing. Allies of America around the world, when I speak to world leaders, they are more concerned about this than anything else by a long margin. America's adversaries see significant potential and opportunity for themselves. And what could the potential return of Donald Trump to office mean for uh, the conflict in the Middle East and Ukraine? 
Well, for example, uh, Trump comes in office, he sees Zelensky as an adversary that refused to do his bidding in opening investigations on Biden and Hunter, he, Hunter Biden. He will demand um, an end to the war with the Ukrainians uh, needing to accept terms from Russia that are unacceptable. He will cut the Ukrainians off from aid. When that happens, that's not the Americans pulling out of NATO, but it is countries like Poland and the Baltic states and Finland and Sweden facing risks that are unacceptable to their national security from the Americans. It will drive a wedge in NATO, in Europe, and cause a major crisis, while leaders like Ita Italy's Prime Minister Maloney, Hungary's Orban, will be aligned with Trump and saying, yeah, let's start working with the Russians again. We're spending too much money. Let's end this. Let's, let's find a way to engage. So it is really a crisis for the EU. It's really a crisis for NATO. Also on the Middle East, remember, when Trump was president, he was the one when the Iranians were causing trouble that ordered the assassination of Qasem Soleimani. And he said, uh, that was the head of the Iranian Defense Forces, that never would the Iranians be supporting the Houthis uh, or, or Hamas like this for attacks if he was president, because he'd show them what for. Well, the likelihood of a U.S. war against Iran, if Trump becomes president, is far, far higher. Now, maybe Iran will fold. Maybe they'll surrender again. Maybe they won't. Uh, again, the risks on the global stage. When Trump was president the first time around, there were no major conflicts on the global stage. It's like a pilot taking over, an inexperienced pilot taking over a plane for a few minutes when you're at 40,000 feet and the sky is clear. But what if you're in a blinding storm and you're trying to land and you can barely see the runway and then you hand over um, the steering wheel up to this completely inexperienced and volatile pilot. You might crash the plane. Well, that, that's what we're looking at in 2024. Well, Ian Bremen, Bremer, thank you so much for your insight. There are so many more risks uh, listed on your uh, report, but I'm afraid that's all we have time for for now. But thanks once again, and thanks to you for watching. Don't forget, you can also catch up with this and all our previous episodes on our website. If you have any questions or comments, you can reach out to us on social media. See you next time. The French are always on strike. That is, of course, when they're not on vacation or eating baguettes with stinky cheese. But are these cliches really true? And if not, what's life actually like in France? French Connections is your guide to the intricacies of life here in France. Bringing you straight to the heart of a truly French point of view. Don't miss French Connections Plus on France 24, bien sûr. Ha, ha, ha.